Welcome, everybody, to another edition of CPG Insiders. I'm your host, Mark Young, with my co-host and trusty sidekick, Justin Gerard. No, it's good. Nothing wrong being sidekick. (laughs) So uh, one of our great friends to the podcast, personal friend, and one of our great advisors for our clients is with us today, Justin, and that's David Birnbaum. David's company is David Birnbaum & Associates. Some some folks probably have heard of them, and it's and we'll have all David's social media and website and everything in the show notes. So all you have to do is go to cpginsiders.com, look for the show notes with the episode with David Birnbaum, Mm -hmm. the one you're listening to, and you'll be able to track him down and find him. So David, we asked you to join us today because we want to talk about the Rite Aid bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And I've got some of the legal input. I wanted to get some input. Uh, let's start off with what, what's your thoughts about this whole thing, Rite Aid filing bankruptcy? Not a surprise, right? No, no not a surprise. And uh, actually, I had anticipated this happening a lot earlier than it has, or really several times before. You know, Rite Aid has had uh, a really, <laughs> a really tough, Several years. Um, I mean, where, yeah, twenty years ago, Rite Aid hanging on by their fingertips. Yeah, well, you know, I think it was in two thousand six or so. Um, you know, they had two of their CEOs that were put in jail for accounting uh, crimes. Um, they now, even as we speak, even with a bankruptcy. Part of this mess is, um, you know, they're being sued by the government for abuse of opioid uh, Mm -hmm. prescriptions between 2014 and 2019. Uh, They ignored our friends at the DOJ for any guidance, you know, about illegal uh, distribution. They've also had lawsuits against them for misleading shoppers about the health benefits of oral care, dry mouth disc, of all things. And, um, you know, in the first quarter of this year, they lost 300 and about $307 million. Uh, the revenues came out to about $5.6 billion, but that's down about $350 million uh, year over year. Uh, the predicted loss, I think, for this year is going to be about $680 million for their fiscal year. Uh, so, you know, last year, I think Rite Aid blamed the prescription drug plan membership losses, um, but that that wasn't uh, really the reason. Uh, they closed 25 stores in the first quarter already this year, and now uh, one group of bondholders uh, wants them to liquidate a significant number of more stores Rite Aid only wants to liquidate 20% from what I'm hearing. But, um, you know, Mark and Justin, I can't imagine that suppliers are going to want to start all over and do business with them with any stores um, because of the ongoing risk. And plus, if I'm a supplier, which, you know, I am, if I'm a supplier and I'm already not getting paid for the inventory that they have, why would I start all over again and uh, ship them more merchandise? So I don't, it's hard for me to imagine without the cooperation of suppliers in getting a restart or a reboot, it's hard for me to imagine that they can be in business at all with any stores. But right now, that's still their plan. Their plan is to close about 20% more of the stores and go on, you know, business as usual uh, with whatever is left of that. Um, But I don't, I don't think that's realistic. Do you? Well, let let me give, let me give our listeners some of the good news here. There actually is some good news here, David. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're right. They want to get rid of about three or 400 stores. So filing bankruptcy, first off, what pushed the bankruptcy? Well, I agree. The bankruptcy pushed by some bad management. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The they didn't have the capital to withstand the OxyContin 
uh, lawsuit. lawsuit. Yeah. Because remember, Walgreens is what three point three billion that Walgreens paid. Yeah. Kroger paid yeah a billion. Yep. Everybody's thrown money into this lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Have the cash on hand. So first off. Rite Aid's not the only person that got clipped on this opioid thing. Nope. They just happened to be the people standing there that didn't have yeah. money to dish it out. And I, I, the whole opioid thing's a little shaky in as much as when is the pharmacy supposed to tell the patient, no, I'm not going to fill the prescription that your doctor gave you? Right. Yeah. Well, that's the tricky part about it is they were prescriptions. Correct. Right. So, yeah, I mean, doctors uh, wrote prescriptions for Rite Aid to uh, distribute. So that is that is um, kind of an erroneous, ironic part of the whole scenario. And, you know, I guess you're right. I guess uh, it's really hard to hold that against them. It's more the way it was handled or the way it wasn't handled opposed to the way Walgreens handled the way that um, uh, the supermarket pharmacies handled the way that Walmart handled CVS, um, you know, a lot better. I mean, here's the bottom line. Doctors wrote prescriptions for Oxy. Mm -hmm. People took their Oxy script. They went to Rite Aid, Walgreens, CVS, Kroger, whatever the case is, they handed in their script. The pharmacist filled the script. Mm -hmm. The DOJ decided we're going to go after the big chains to pay for this. Oh, yeah. Now, did the big chains write the scripts? No. Were the, does the pharmacist have a, have a responsibility to fill a script that a bona fide doctor provides? Yeah, they do. They do. So why did DOJ go after the pharmacies? Because they're big and have deep pockets and we know where to find you. Right. I can't go after 100,000 doctors and try to collect from all of them. It's correct. To collect after eight major retailers than it is to try to collect after tens of thousands of physicians. Oh, that's correct. So that's why these guys got clipped. Now, here's a little thing that I will share with you. After all of this, the top three pharmaceuticals sold at almost every drugstore right now are all three of them are oxy. Yeah. In different doses. So even after all this, it's still the biggest. It's still the biggest drug being filled. Yeah, it sure is. So and, yeah. it's a money grab. It's yeah. a it's a money grab on on the part of the federal government. Go uh, figure. <laughs> the bankruptcy will allow Rite Aid to be able to jettison these four hundred, right. and they can walk away from the leases. So it's going to cause a lot of problems for people who rent buildings to Rite Aid. Yeah. Right. And it's probably going to be a problem where we're located. Our offices are here in Michigan. Michigan is one of the biggest Rite Aid states in the country. Yep. Uh, Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania. Yeah, 11% of their stores are in Michigan. I think yep. 245 stores. That's a lot. So Michigan real estate is going to take a hit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, here's some of the good news. Some of the good news is these Rite Aid stores, many of them are located on very prime locations. They are. So I would expect to see CVS and Walgreens come in and grab up some of this real estate. Sure. So when those stores go shut down, if CVS and Walgreens doesn't have a store within darn near, you know, eyesight of those locations, they'll move in and take those locations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think especially like in markets like Pittsburgh and Buffalo, Brooklyn, New York. Mm hmm. Those are the three biggest markets for Rite Aid. And, um, you know, Pittsburgh's got 40-something stores, I think 42. Buffalo is 33. And Brooklyn has 25. So I think you're right. I, I could see uh, Walgreens and CVS where they don't already have a store across the street. Um, those three markets in particular. There's also some markets in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty big or in California, Portland, Oregon and um, San Diego, Los Angeles and California. Uh, those are all pretty significant Rite Aid markets and good opportunities for the competitors. Now, let's talk about vendors that are in there. Yeah. If so, when a company files Chapter 11, there's two ways to go bankrupt. You can file Chapter 11 or Chapter 7. 
Mm-hmm. Chapter 11 is what's called debtor in possession from a legal standpoint. Mm-hmm. So the company is so in a chapter 11, which is what Rite Aid's done. Mm-hmm. Chapter 11, management gets to continue to run the business. And they do this under what's called bankruptcy protection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But to maintain your bankruptcy uh, protection, there are very strict requirements. You got to pay your bills. So when they filed the bankruptcy, they would have filed something called a matrix of debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That matrix will tell us who have they listed on there. Now, normally, anybody who they haven't paid, any vendor that they haven't paid for 90 days or less, actually shouldn't be on there and should be considered a current debt. Mm-hmm. So if you're a supplier to, to Rite Aid and your invoices are 30 days old, 60 days old, you're, you'll get paid. You'll yeah. probably get paid. Here's the second thing. In a debtor in possession bankruptcy, to maintain your protection, all current debts have to be paid exactly on time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you're a vendor and Rite Aid now sends you a, a, an order and says, right. we want to buy $20,000 worth of toothpaste, they have to list that. They have to create a monthly matrix to the court. That matrix would have to say, we owe, we owe David Bierenbaum $20,000 for toothpaste. Our terms are net 30, net 60. If they don't pay for that exactly on time, the court can step in and mm-hmm. a trustee to run the company or convert them from chapter 11 to chapter seven. Mm-hmm. So where I'm going with this is during the bankruptcy, you're going to get paid. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, once the company's in chapter 11, they file something which is, which is called a plan of, react, of reorganization. Mm-hmm. The plan of reorganization says, here's our plan, judge. Mm-hmm. We're going to 400 stores. We're going to blow off these shareholders. We're going to eliminate this debt. Because remember, if they have long-term debt, they can blow it off. They can discount bondholders. They can get rid of bondholders. Mm-hmm. They, can, they can liquidate shareholders. Think of anybody who owns stock in GM when GM filed bankruptcy. Yeah, right. Went to zero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. GM had the ability to issue new stock. Yeah. So Rite Aid will actually have the ability to issue new stock and print new money to create new money. So they can actually generate new money doing this. Mm -hmm. And banks are likely to loan them money because any bank that loans them money now is going to get get paid. Right. Yeah. It's the banks that they owe right now that are going to get burned. Yeah. Yes. Right. So what I'm saying is, if you're currently selling a product in Rite Aid, mm-hmm. check and see if you're 90 days or older. If you're 90 days or older, you probably aren't getting paid. Yeah. But anything you ship right now, you will get paid. Yeah. My other question to you, David, is you know the people at Rite Aid. Mm-hmm. Let's say I am a Rite Aid vendor. What's Rite Aid's uh, What's Rite Aid's normal payment terms right now? Is it net sixty, net ninety, net one twenty? For, for most vendors, it's sixty. For any newer vendors that came aboard, let's say within the last five years, it's about it's ninety or even greater. In some cases, it's one hundred and twenty. Yeah, and those one hundred and twenty people, they're probably not getting paid. No. Right. And I I do need to say though that um, even the sixty day and ninety day. Uh, vendors, they they haven't been paid in a long time. I mean, Rite Aid's way past the due date with yeah. most of those vendors. And a lot of them aren't going to get paid. Yep. Right. Now, if Rite Aid comes back to me and wants me to to supply them, and I want to get David's opinion, my opinion is you need to negotiate better payment terms. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. So I would probably, if Rite Aid wanted to continue to carry my product, assuming my product is making money for Rite Aid. If my product's in trouble, that's a different issue. But my product's making money. I would probably go back to my buyer and I would say, look, I'll ship, but I'm shipping net 30 or I'm shipping net 45. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I need that in writing. Mm -hmm. 
Because if they give it to you in writing, they have to do it while they're in bankruptcy. Right. For sure. Right. Much more so than they had to do it before. Right. So where the real risk will become, by the way, where the real risk is, once they file their plan of reorganization, mm -hmm. the debtors get to vote on it. Mm -hmm. And then the judge either approves it, modifies it, or rejects it. Right. When the judge approves it, then they technically come out of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. When they come out of bankruptcy, that's actually the bigger risk of, risk of going back to bad payment practices. Right. Yes. Because now you don't have a judge supervising the payment program. Yeah. Now, there is also a risk here. And the other risk is all these people who owe them money now become what's called uh they become the debtor the debtor board the debtor committee okay now they don't all have to be on the committee but they all have the right to be on the committee okay mm -hmm. so when they get their bankruptcy notice you get a notice in the mail you can take your notice and say i want to be on the creditor committee mm -hmm. the creditor committee gets to vote there is the possibility, and there are rumors right now, and you're probably hearing them too. Yeah, for sure. That the creditor committee is going to try to force Rite Aid into a full liquidation, or the creditor committee will want someone else to buy it. Yeah, I've heard that. Or the creditor committee will want to run the company because they've lost faith in current management. Well, that's for absolute certain. Yeah. And, and it's not unusual to lose faith in management when you file bankruptcy. It's, I have to say, too, it's not unusual to lose faith in management in Rite Aid. Well, yeah, that's kind of a given. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've had no faith in Rite Aid for a long time. I mean, I can't be a valuable guest on this show if I didn't say candidly and honestly that Rite Aid hasn't had a very positive relationship with its suppliers i don't really know about the banks but as far as suppliers it hasn't been very good for a very long time it hasn't been and keep in mind folks rite aid currently has 2.3 percent of the u.s market yeah uh-huh so this is not like losing cvs cvs no cvs is standing at 25.2 percent market right. share yeah Walgreens is standing at 15.5% market share mm -hmm. and Rite Aid's at 2.3. Right. So if you, if you are a product that has 70% or above ACV, mm -hmm. you, 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 yeah. you run the risk at 2% of your, your, your total overall sales. You're a little bit. And those people aren't going to stop shopping. They're going, no, they're going to buy it somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna buy it somewhere else. So I guess my question to you, Mark, would be, and and David, is, let's talk about the other possible vendors who, maybe Rite Aid is one of their only retailers or one of their biggest retailers because they just started getting into the marketplace now, and mm -hmm. was the first one to say yes. What That's a good point. There are there are places where Rite Aid's probably the only one carrying the product. So what what advice do we have for? those brands that are looking at this news going, well, that 2.3% may be nothing to those bigger guys, but to me, this could be my whole business. right? Well, now. and Justin, one of the examples of that are the private label. Oh, yeah. Manufacturers. Um, Rite Aid does have a tendency to use private label manufacturers that aren't supplying CVS and Walgreens and Walmart and everybody else uh, because maybe there was only one or two private label manufacturers who would do business anymore with Rite Aid. So they're not, you know, they're, they're got a uphill battle too. Yeah. If Rite Aid's your only account, first off, if Rite Aid's your only account and there was no bankruptcy, I would be telling you your business is in trouble. Well, yeah. sure. mm -hmm. that's sure. before the bankruptcy. Right. <clears throat> For sure. If Rite Aid's your only account, Better check the dating on your invoices mm -hmm. because you may not be getting paid or you may be getting. And what will happen is when the courts approve a repayment plan, yeah, it'll probably say it'll take all the creditors and it'll put them into classes. Okay? Yeah. So vendors will actually be a higher class. 
mm. than let's say an unsecured debtor. Okay. So uh, stockholders are the bottom of the class, right? Well, uh, yeah, it's like this. It's ninety one percent lower than it was a year ago today. The, right. Yeah. So the top of the class will be federal government. Hmm. They're the top of the class. Shocking. Secured creditors are the next class. Mm-hmm. So those are banks who have liens yeah. on real property or receivables or whatever the case is. Yep. So the feds will get paid first. Yep. Secured creditors get paid next. Yep. The suppliers will get paid third. Okay. What about landlords? Landlords are just out. <laughs> yep. So if I'm behind on the rent, you ain't getting it. Mm-hmm. Have to make the current rent payment, or you can boot right. me out. You might know this more than I do, but I think that most of their properties are leased. They're all properties, as is CVS's and Walgreens. Yeah, yeah. So, if you're a vendor to Walgreens, when the plan gets approved, the plan will probably say, "We're going to pay X pennies on the dollar to mm-hmm. this class." Right. So it might say we're going to pay uh, 15 cents on the dollar to vendors. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that 15 cents on the dollars will be spread over 60 to 84 months. Right. So it'll be a monthly payment. Mm -hmm. Let's just do the math. They owe me 100 grand. Right. They're going to pay 15%. So now they owe me 15. Mm -hmm. They're going to pay me over 60 months. So they're going to pay me, uh, what's that come out to? $333 a year. Right. Divided by 12, they're going to send me a check for 60 bucks a month. Right. So that's what my $100,000 receivable is going to turn into, $60 a month uh, for the next 60 months. And and so I guess uh, with that in mind, I mean, uh, and, and again, I'm really thinking about these these brands that that, that this is a big part of their business. I guess, what should they do next? Because if you stop supporting Rite Aid, your IRI numbers are starting to get hit even worse than they might be already with some store closings, which doesn't look good if you're trying to expand your distribution. But then with this in mind, from a cash flow perspective, you might be getting hit even harder because you're probably not getting hit if they're already late. You have payments that have not been made that are that long. So you're already losing money. I guess, what what should they do for the long-term health of the brand? So I, I yeah. think vendor and David, what do you think? I think as a vendor, if I'm well, a, some vendors are going to decide to quit doing business. Well, and, you know, obviously I can't say a name of a company, um, you know, who I work with, mm-hmm. yep. but there's at least one very, very large supplier uh, who's already decided that they're done with Rite Aid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what, where I'm going with that is, Mm-hmm. Maybe an opportunity for some smaller brands, okay? Because some of the bigger brands who just don't need it are just gonna, right. Some of the bigger brands are going to say, "God, they got two percent market share. They're never paying yeah. to forget this. I, this isn't worth our time." Mm-hmm. Which would make sense because I'll pick it up at Walgreens and Kroger yeah. and CVS. Yeah. yeah, or a supermarket pharmacy, or uh, the or Walmart or Target or. Amazon or or anyone else. So for the brands, so with the big brands bailing out, mm-hmm. this may be an opportunity for smaller brands to be more important inside the the remaining Rite Aid stores. Mm-hmm. So then, is it like you're saying? Do you then double down? Or, I don't want to say double down, but it, get stronger with your support of it because a you are going to get paid once it goes through. You're going to get paid during the bankruptcy. Right. So you know during right. the bankruptcy. And you have big players that are moving out of support for it. So, what I'm, so, Justin, what I'm advising my clients is obviously to be very, very strict and disciplined about the terms. Mm-hmm. Um, your goal, if you want to do business with them, is just to make sure you don't get burned at the end. Right. And so the quantities that you ship them should be limited you should resist the temptation to promote, mm. uh, to buy big promotions, or to ship larger quantities. Uh, that takes discipline because for the first time ever, Rite Aid is going to be very hospitable right. about the promotions. They're actually going to 
they're going to be uh, good partners with vendors that, you know, that hasn't happened in a long time. So, but vendors have to be, especially small vendors who get trapped into making bad deals with retailers. They're going to have to be very disciplined that, no, all I want to do is keep your shelves filled. I only want to replenish. I only want to ship when the merchandise is needed on the shelf and, you know, at the, at the DC, I don't want to ship you any more than that. I don't want to buy displays. I don't want to be on display. Um, and 30 days are going to be my terms, regardless of what programs we do. They, that's how I'm advising it. Um, cause you know, it's going to happen. Um, with the stores remaining, you know, they're, they're going to want their stores to be loaded with, um, sidekicks and displays and to make it an exciting yep. uh, shopping experience. And they're certainly going to have, want to have big promotions and they're going to promote on price and all those things, but that isn't necessarily in the best interest of the supplier. I would probably, I agree with you. I would probably look at in-store promotion at Rite Aid's expense. Absolutely. I would, you know, and even, even if Rite Aid said, okay, we're going to give you extra shelf space. We're going to give you this. Great. I'll take the shelf space, but I'm not paying slotting fees. I'm not paying for it. Mm -hmm. It would probably be a good time to present Rite Aid with an, a new SKU. If you have another one you're trying to put in, they'd probably be hungry for a new SKU. But again, make darn sure that it's an SKU that can sell through or you're just going to eat it. Right. And but, Justin, to a point you made earlier about the IRI share, which is really the reason that a lot of suppliers still do business with them, right. is because they're IRI track. But the 2.3%, by my math, is probably going to be like around 1.5% hmm. when this is all said and done, you know, of the ACV. No. But, yeah. Hey. When you look at, they've got a 2.3 market share mm -hmm. and they're about to get rid of 20% of those stores. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus, some consumers are just going to bail out a Rite Aid when they know they're in bankruptcy because some consumers just yes, aren't going awesome. to feel comfortable. Yeah. Especially with their prescription drugs. Right. right. And again, we don't know how their shipment on prescription drugs is doing. Yep. So, you know, there's the possibility of running out of some prescription drugs. The, Very good possibility. So I think the other thing I would do is if I had a Rite Aid dependent business, mm -hmm. depending on the product I had, mm -hmm. if I've got a if I've got an innovative product, if I've got a health related product, mm -hmm. I would probably take a real hard look at Kroger and PharmaVision. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I would do. Yeah. So if Rite Aid is your only market, yep. Depending on your product, you could you could do the Kroger Pharma Vision program. Yep. Kroger is the busiest pharmacies in America. Mm -hmm. That gives you two thousand pharmacies, and just so people understand, like a, a Rite Aid sees a hundred to hundred and fifty prescriptions a day. Yeah. Kroger gets eight hundred prescriptions right. per day, average store count. They're actually the busiest pharmacies in the country. Yeah, and after the merger with Albertsons goes through, it'll probably be almost double that. Correct. So I would look at if it was me and I and my business was hinging on Rite Aid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would probably be inquiring on the PharmaVision program to see if I could qualify mm -hmm. to get into PharmaVision. That makes sense. And it's going to cost you money to get in there, but it's going to cost you money to stay in Rite Aid anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and, and, and supermarket pharmacies, and particularly Kroger and PharmaVision, um, they really have taken over a significant amount of pharmacy market share over the last 10 years. Um, yeah. yeah, Kroger's got over 3% market share now for pharmacy. Yeah, you know, it's not like it used to be where it was a convenience to their grocery shoppers. Uh, it's a destination pharmacy now for a lot of consumers. There's and people that go into the stores to get their prescriptions filled who actually walk out of there without, um, you know, without buying potatoes or green right. beans. 
Well, also keep in mind Kroger has uh, Kroger has drive-throughs on most of their stores now. Oh, okay. They do. They're out on the parking lot, and, which is very convenient. It's actually more convenient than the drugstore drive up to the side of the window where there's usually eleven cars in front of you, and there's only one clerk inside or one pharmacy tech. PharmaVision, uh, any new brand or even an established brand, um, you know, that's when I first heard about it, I thought it was too good to be true because your product is going to be right in the pharmacy, right in front on the shelf, right in front of where the pharmacists are working in the pharmacy techs. So they're going to get to know the products in that section extremely well. They're going to hear the video and probably watch it over and over again. So they're going to be educated about the products that are there. And as you said, uh, Kroger already has, what, a 3% market yep. share that's yeah. going to grow probably to 5% or greater in the near future. Um, you can't ask for anything better for your brand than that. I mean, that's an ideal situation. The pharmacist is the most credible person of any profession there is. The pharmacist is more credible than a doctor. Um, so when a pharmacist, just the, the implication of your product being right there in the pharmacy, and occasionally a pharmacy tech or a pharmacist saying, yeah, that's a good item. Um, your brand is going to grow everywhere, not just at Kroger, but everywhere. Well, do you think, David, um, you know, just looking at future implications, do you think that for some of these vendors and brands that may take a hit because of what's going on at Rite Aid and when they're going to future meetings, do you think the retailers are going to listen to this story and, and understand the context or say, well, you, you still didn't sell product, doesn't matter which what was going on at Rite Aid, you still should have been moving units, so I'm not going to take you in. Will this affect their ability to sell, do you think, to other retailers, or does it depend possibly? Well, on you know, if I'm making a, if I'm doing a business review with any other retailer, and if my sales weren't good at Rite Aid, it's pretty easy for me to explain that, and the retailer will respect and understand that. If I say, yeah, you know, my market share right now is down a half a percent or a percent, or my business is down a percent. And frankly, between you and me, that was right aid business that I walked away from. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to get a pat on the back. <laughs> um, you're probably going to get empathy. Uh, and it's actually a positive thing. You know, the boy, you know, I wish I could be nicer about this, but the industry doesn't really have a tremendous amount of respect mm -hmm. for Rite Aid. Yeah, that's been that way for decades. Yeah, the vendors certainly don't. Mm -hmm. And companies like Walgreens knows that Rite Aid's been paid as much for their promotions, having one-eighth the traffic that an average Walgreens has as Walgreens gets paid. Well, they don't, they don't like that. Right. And so I don't, other than Rite Aid shareholders and creditors who don't get paid, um, a whole lot of people aren't going to show up to the funeral. <laughs> so I want to I want to tag on to something that David said about having discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a good possibility here that Rite Aid buyers, and I don't I don't know this to be the case. Mm -hmm. But there's a good possibility that Rite Aid buyers might start reaching back out to brands who have called on them in the past and Rite Aid has rejected them. For sure. Mm -hmm. And when they do, Rite Aid has a long history of like enormous free goods slotting fees. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> so don't be surprised for Rite Aid to come back and say, well, we've decided we'll bring in your X product. But we want four pieces per store, <laughs> free free goods. Right, right. That's not unusual with Rite Aid. Let's say you're a brand new brand and you're looking, saying, "Well, I've never been in retail. This is my chance to get into." Yeah. It. 
like Nancy Reagan said, just say no. <laughs> just say no. <laughs> there, I don't. I don't believe it's worth the value to give free goods for every remaining Rite Aid store to get on no. their shelf right now. No, no, no. no I mean, no. what do you think, David? And yeah, and you know, guys, I went through this with Kmart. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, the end, really, folks. <laughs> Um, anybody who went through that with Kmart uh, and got burned each time, <laughs> uh, they might have learned their lessons. Same thing, obviously, with Sears for the same reason, same company. And then there were a lot of other smaller drug chains throughout the years. Uh, you had some right there in Michigan, you know, smaller drug chains uh, that kind of phase themselves out. Um, you know, and, and small suppliers were left kind of holding the bomb. Yeah, probably Harry, the Perry drug, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Happy Harry's? Harry. Oh, Remember yeah. Perry drug? Perry, Perry drug, yeah, and F&M. And, um, Perry, was, Perry was who Rite Aid bought. That's why they got such a big Michigan footprint. Yeah, they bought Perry. and So the big drug stores here in Michigan were Arbor Drugs, yep. Perry yep. Drug, uh-huh. Cunningham's. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And F and M for a while. And F and M for a while. And Cunningham's and Arbor became the same. Yep. Then uh -huh. Arbor became CVS. Yep. And Perry became Rite Aid. Yep. <laughs> Greens just stormed in and built. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember that well. And, and we probably are better represented with CVS stores here in Michigan than we are with. Yeah. Them. Yeah. We are. Absolutely. Where else would you go? What else would you tell people if they're uh, if they? I'm uh, here's what I'm envisioning, David. I'm envisioning we just had NACDS last mm -hmm. month, right? I mean, I'm, I'm envisioning all these young entrepreneurs with their first time at NACDS mm -hmm. and Rite Aid buyer, and a Rite Aid buyer says, "You know what? Maybe we'll say yes to this." And I came away all excited because Rite Aid said they might say yes. Mm -hmm. Should be very frightened because Rite Aid said they may say yes. So it gets back to don't give them the free goods, mm -hmm. demand payment, demand good terms, push for some promotion at their expense. Yep. And you need you you're just going to need to keep these people on a really short leash. Yep. And try to get some decent IRI numbers so that you can go use the IRI, but. Like I said, you could go Pharma Vision. Where else would you go? Would you would you just immediately be chasing Walgreens or CVS? Yeah, um, you know, I love your Pharma Vision um, idea for a lot of reasons, um, especially if you have a product that's kind of OTC, uh, you know, self medicated, self medicate type uh, orientation. But how I am advising my clients, in fact. When I was supposed to be on with you guys last week, I was dealing with a, a foreign um, company that literally just got a product in or accepted by Rite Aid uh, February of this year. And I had to be the guy to say, I suggest you just hold off on it because it's a it would be a big order. Mm. There's a lot of free goods involved. And, um, you know, slotting allowances and and uh, co-op advertising commitments and a lot of other things. I wasn't too keen on it, even when they committed to it. But I was the guy that got to tell them right now, you need to pull out because you can still get distribution there, but you're not going to have to live up to all those things that you signed off on not at all and i'm kind of in the middle of that right now because of course rite aid is saying well you already committed to those things you are you're legally obligated to everything that you already committed to you are not no. you're not no <laughs> so, so yes. not with all greens and or with uh, rite aid right. in the past 90 days and you haven't fulfilled it yet, you can go renegotiate that deal. Absolutely. And, you know, Rite Aid has always had people 
on their team that, you know, use a bit of intimidation and uh, the bully approach and all that. It's always uh, odd because the they've always been the smallest kid on the block <laughs> and the ones that have always been the most aggressive and the most demanding. They are. Yeah. They always uh, have been. It's, it's been difficult to make money at Rite Aid for a long time. It's very difficult. Um, I, I work with a private label supplier who has made money in the past doing business with Rite Aid because a private label business is so black and white um, in terms of how dollars are exchanged. But they, too, um, are in a panic right now because their terms with Rite Aid are always so much in Rite Aid's favor. So, um, you know, it's it's not a great situation for anybody. Um, but as you said earlier, in the markets where Rite Aid really matters, like Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Brooklyn, L.A., San Diego, Virginia Beach, and these other places where they have a lot of stores, um, the consumers are easily going to switch. And suppliers won't lose market share. It'll just increase in other retail chains that they're doing business with. And the other retail chains will help them with that. Um, I think it's really going to have its most impact on people that have financial um, situations with them. I really don't think it's going to, other than a few markets like Pittsburgh and the others, I don't really think it's going to have that big of an impact on the market itself. Now, well, um, well, we got a couple of minutes left here. I want to ask David a, another question about retail, but on a different note, we see that um, CVS, I believe it is, is it CVS is going to close three or 400 stores? Yeah. Uh-huh. And it appears, I don't know what you think. I think most of those stores are being closed because of shoplifting. There, that's exactly why. Two reasons. Number one is the shoplifting and the gang uh, theft, which is affecting drugstores all over the country. And the other reason is personnel. They just can't get enough employees to work in the stores. So it's really those two reasons combined. It's a really odd situation because it's not like there's less consumers in those markets. There's not. And they don't want to close them down, but they're losing money because of the theft, the shoplifting, and then also because they just don't have enough personnel to work in those stores. Some pharmacies are actually shutting down the pickup window business, which is their most convenient service that they offer. Are you robbed at the window? Uh, they just don't have the personnel. Oh, from a staffing standpoint. Wow. Yeah, from a staffing standpoint. So this um, is going urban and inner city consumers well the urban and inner city consumers are going to lose all their stores i'm sure you've been watching what's happening in san francisco and really a lot of cities in california but all over the place um a stores city. are leaving the city I mean, even nordstrom's is leaving the big cities right. and that's where all their main stores were the targets closing stores in yeah. Uh, San Francisco, Portland, and uh, New York, and I think Baltimore. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'll be pretty blunt about this. Um, politicians have to accept the fact that this is one of the biggest problems right now facing this country, and they can't keep ignoring it. The yeah, shoplifting $112 billion as of last yeah. For this year, Billy, yeah, Billy. And, and I know this is a little bit off topic, but the decriminalization is taking place in a lot of these cities where these people aren't even getting punished for doing this. I mean, come on, common sense. What do you think is going to happen? So let me give, I'm going to give our retailers a little secret. <clears throat> If you want to make your product less attractive to be stolen. <laughs> so keep in mind, as a retailer, we look at our product and say, well, we sold it to Walgreens. Somebody stole it. That's Walgreens problem. Mm -hmm. It's not just Walgreens problem. No. no. 
it's going to become your problem in a number of ways. One of the ways it's your problem is Walgreens or whoever can get to a point where they'll say it's no longer profitable to carry your product because of theft. Right. Two, your product's going to show up on the world's largest fence, which Amazon. is Amazon and eBay. <laughs> yes. And now your product's going to, your $30 item is going to be on Amazon remarkably for $15. Right. Because it's been stolen. So here's something we learned, David, and that uh -huh. is the thieves don't like stealing stuff. They come in boxes. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Because the boxes get damaged too easily when you're hiding them in your bags and your pockets. <laughs> yeah. So they become harder to resell. So and if the the yep. green the green movement is encouraging. Yes. Uh, manufacturers not to use boxes. Yep. So when you're dealing with your with your buyer and your buyer says, well, we'd rather you just put the tube on the shelf, <laughs> we're going to save on boxing, remind your buyer, but we're going to put it in a box with a fifth panel on it, <laughs> which makes it too hard to steal because the fifth panel gets destroyed when you hide it in your pants. Uh-huh. Yeah, and you know the lock and key thing is going to kill the business anyway. And you, that can't be the future. That cannot be the future of merchandising. Is you know all the products being behind lock and key? There's a zillion reasons that doesn't work well, and that can't be the answer. They're doing it right now out of desperation. And I was talking about to losing business. The RFID tags that set yeah. off door alarms. And I said to this retailer, I'm like, well, how about put RFID alarms on it. And his comment was, that's a great idea because it tells my staff who to wave at when they walk out. The yeah, that's exactly right. He's just, that's all our staff does is just wave them through. Right. They're not going to stop us. Why would they stop them? They well, don't we, I live in a city where the mayor has said that the reason for all this theft is because these people need the products. They need it for survival. <laughs> I don't have for this ever last <laughs> ready for the term it is no longer shoplifting david it's for resale the term is retail reparations retail reparation yes this is yeah. retail reparations oh my god that's actually a term that the left is using for shoplifting now. <laughs> yes, retail reparation. And, and, you know, they're using these retail reparation products to sell on eBay. Yes. <laughs> and some people are making a lot of money doing that. Yeah, they're the world's biggest fence now. They are. So keep watching Rite Aid, or keep watching, not Rite Aid, keep watching eBay and keep watching Amazon. Yeah. See if your products are showing up right. at half price and keep filing complaints with eBay and keep filing complaints with Amazon that these are unauthorized vendors. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and and Justin, how much how good can you do with Amazon with unauthorized vendors? Can you get them knocked off? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean it, it's a process. As long as long as you're registered, which you're gonna have to be registered now to sell on Amazon. So you have to be with brand registry at through the trademark program, which so What's great is that it's easy to defend it and get rid of them. You just have to go through the process with them. Now, how about eBay? Uh, eBay is a lot easier to throw stuff. eBay is a lot easier. And, you know, I can compete with you on eBay with your own product pretty easily. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because my cost of the products were zero. Right. I have zero product costs. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did have to pay for gas to get to the store, maybe. And, but. And the shoplifting is this is not one person going in. No, so, no, these are gangs. Right. This is organized retail crime rings where they're literally going in and they're going in with instructions. It's not grab what you can. They're going in saying, okay, these are the items. These are what we need on eBay this week. Go collect these items. Mm -hmm. This is what we're selling. This is what's moving. It is. And Man, you guys know this. Um, I'll just say politicians. I won't identify them by party or anything else. But 
politicians need to wake up. They need to wake up. Um, they need to accept reality and what's really going on. And it can't be offensive to arrest people. That's got to change. And I'm just saying it from a retail perspective and consumer products perspective. This industry cannot survive with brick and mortar retail stores until crime in until there's law enforcement. It's dead if it if there's no law enforcement. There's no formula that without law enforcement is going to work. What will happen is that all of the business will go e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the only person who makes money is Jeff Bezos. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're so right. <laughs> okay, right now, folks, you do not make money on Amazon. No. You, no. you sell product. You get good reviews. Getting a high number of reviews on Amazon is important because people use Amazon as a review site. But you're not making money at it. No. No. Most categories and if you and here's the problem, you can make money for a year. Mm -hmm. You got a hot item. You can make money for a year to a half a year, but within a year, either Amazon knocks you off, somebody else. or the Chinese manufacturers knock you off directly, where they're making the product and have you crushed on product cost. Oh, they wouldn't do that <laughs> for half the price. Yeah. Of so we have tools that we use, like a tool we have is called Helium 10. Mm -hmm. and we Helium can, 10. Helium 10. And we have this if you ever need to use it, David. And you can go into Helium 10, and I can look and find who's got a hot item right now that's making money uh -huh. for the sole purpose of knocking that product off. Mm -hmm. I literally yeah. go in and say, oh, look, this, this new spatula is killing it on eBay. I go over to Alibaba. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a Chinese manufacturer who makes that spatula. I throw it up on Amazon for $2 less than the guy who's killing it right now. And I make money for a couple of months and then somebody comes and undercuts me and eventually it's a race to the bottom. So you can make money on Amazon, but if you do make money on Amazon, it's always short lived. Because eventually you get knocked off or Amazon decides to knock you off if if you're an o, a drug, an OTC, something like that. They come up with a private label just like everybody else does. Sure. And they have private label everything already. Right. Um, Amazon, you're not sitting on the shelf next to the private label because Amazon always makes their product the dominant product. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have some new clients or would-be clients that I have to go through all this now with the gang theft or the uh, the realities of what's going on right now in retail. And sometimes they'll say, well, I don't want to discuss politics. So we have to discuss politics because it's a big factor right now in how you can make or not make profit doing business at retail because ultimately you're going to be held accountable for whatever happens there. Uh, retailers still call it um, shrinkage. Yeah, and most manufacturers still have to pay for that. Yeah, a lot of the retailers charge shrinkage back to the vendor. They do, and whereas it used to be like, okay, we can just agree on a half a percent, and I won't, you know, we'll just call it even. Um, I had a retailer tell my client a couple of weeks ago that they need 4%. I can tell you that grocery, and you would think grocery wouldn't be as, as big a theft. Oh, yeah. Grocery is budgeting 5% for, for shrinkage, for theft. And that's not affordable to anybody. That's not affordable. Five points right off the top. And again, what do you think pays for that? Well, all the, it's retail reparations, Justin. Sorry. <laughs> it's really not funny, but it makes me laugh. Well, these are, see, these are people who've been going to Walmart for years and they feel Walmart owes me something. Yeah. So that's what I do. My, my wife went to a Meyer store, which we have lots of Meyer stores here in, sure. in the area. And 
she was in a checkout line and Rite Aid has the spinning bag uh, packers like Walmart has. Yeah. Meyer or, or Rite Aid? Meyer does. So they have, you know, so the shopping bags are like in a big carousel and you just fill the bags and spin the wheel until you get all the bags filled. <laughs> yeah. The checkout next to her was not open. She watched a woman with a shopping cart full of groceries wheel her cart into the closed checkout line, bagged them all, put them back in the cart, and just pushed the cart right out of the store, and no one stopped her. That's probably a $200 cart. Yes, and I bet she wasn't the only one who did it that day. But literally, I mean, bag the groceries. I want yeah. to them in bags. Just go in line, bag them all up. Just like nothing. Just like literally like this is normal. There's yeah. nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I'm just bagging groceries. And puts them back in the cart and walks right through the door. Okay. Probably just a misdemeanor now. Uh, yeah, it was well, in some cities. It isn't even a misdemeanor. Now it's actually been knocked down to what's called civil infraction. Yes. And a civil infraction is a ticket. Yep. A parking ticket is a civil infraction. So it's been lowered to that level where it's not, it mean, should be a felony, but now it's at misdemeanor or civil infraction level. Well, and what consumers need to understand, we already have 7% inflation as it is. But in addition to that, retailers have to raise the prices even more in order to compensate for um, all the losses on the mob thefts. Right. There's been $112 billion in retail reparations so far this year. That $112 billion is divided up amongst 340 million people based on how much product you buy at the store. Yes, but you are paying your share of it back. You certainly are. Every one of us is paying our share of it back. So it is not a victimless crime as as as, as the it's positioned. Argue. This is a victimless crime. They stole stuff from a Walmart. There's no victim there. Yeah, they have insurance. Yeah, Walmart's a big faceless evil company. Yeah. That was that's what, that's what they New vendors will always call me and say, well, we don't want to do business with Walmart because we hear how terrible they are. And I'm always trying to tell people, no, they're great to do business with. Walmart's the easiest. They're the easiest retailer to do business with in the entire industry because yeah. their, their rules are really simple. EDLC, yep. EDLC um, we buy, you, you send, we pay. On time, right. On time. Uh, I would love for every retailer to be just like the Walmart model. Oh, absolutely. Oh, man. Absolutely. Uh, the downside of Walmart is they'll probably never be the first yes when you roll your new product out. No, of course not. They're always going to come after another chain. Yeah. Once in a while, they, I've seen them do it. We've had they're it happen. Right. Yeah. But as a rule, they're not going to be the first to bring you in. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that, and I'll show this real quick and we'll wrap this up. Part of the reason for that is years and years ago, Sam Walton, who was a decent human being. A great guy. Made a company rule that Walmart would never be responsible for putting a, a vendor out of business. Right. So the reason they can't be your first account is because if they don't like you and they send you out, they run the risk of putting you out of business. Yep. So... David, you've probably had this same event. I've had this where a vendor will get to 70%. Walmart will find out that they're 70% of the business. Oh, they don't want to be. And Walmart will call the vendor and say, you need to increase your sales at other accounts and, and get the percentage of sales that we represent of your business down to 40%. Yep. And that's usually what it'll be. Yeah, I've been through that many, many times with small suppliers mm -hmm. um and after we're done i'll send you a letter that i got from sam walton back in uh, 1991 
um, to show you what kind of a guy he was. Uh, he, he, it's not like what people just think, you know, that he started this gigantic company and, you know, made billions of dollars, which he did, but um, he was as down to earth as anybody in any profession anywhere that I ever met. I'll send you this letter he's telling me in the letter. This was six months before he died. Hmm. And he's telling me in the letter that he's going to go quail hunting so that that might make him feel better. Um, he's congratulating the company I'm working for on doing a great job. And you can just tell it's just all coming from his heart and his conscience. And that's the way that he was. There's nobody like him anymore. No, but the company, the company, he's not there, but the company still holds on to some of his values. They do. Oh, they definitely do. Um, but as a human, he used to walk into the lobby where all the vendors were waiting for their meeting. And he would just walk up to the lobby and pull, <laughs> he would pull your name tag like this so that he could read it. <laughs> and like with me, he would say, Oh, Mr. Barenbaum, you know, yeah, Sam. Or I say, yeah, Mr. Walton. And he'd say, well, your name's Dave, right? Yes, sir. Well, if I'm going to call you Dave, you're going to call me Sam. <laughs> Do you remember, now you and I are showing how old we are. Yeah, we are. You remember going into the original Walmart headquarters and standing yeah. in line? It smelled like popcorn. Yeah, like in 1980. Yeah, uh-huh. My God, it's it smelled like popcorn because the headquarters used to be a store. Uh, right. And they used to have a popcorn maker at the front door where they gave popcorn away at the front door. Uh, yeah. And the building reeked of old popcorn. Yes. You'd walk in, it's like, what is that? It's like it's like popcorn. Yep. Because that's where the popcorn machine used to sit right there. That's it, the way it started. Into the floor and into the ceiling, this popcorn smell. And then you went to a room for your meeting and you went into the room. It was a table with chairs on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yes. There would be three chairs on each side. Mm -hmm. That was it. But the first person had to go in the farthest chair. <laughs> right. There's no room to walk, walk around the second chair. No. <laughs> they had to push all the chairs in, go in, <laughs> pull the chair out, and then the next person could sit down. <laughs> The room was that narrow. <laughs> and you remember those rooms? I mean, you couldn't move. Yeah. If you had claustrophobia, you oh, would have no. at a Walmart meeting. And that's how it began. It was like getting it was like getting a, a cat scan with four other people. <laughs> that's a great analogy because that's exactly what it was like. Everybody on this table, we're gonna slide you in the tube, <laughs> see what kind of deal you can make. It was it was it was that cramped. It was insane. Was the new headquarters are nice now? Oh yeah, and there's some of those meetings. Sam was at the table. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, but it you was did, yeah. Oh that was that was just a mess. Well, folks, David, I appreciate you being with us, and uh, we want to have you back and talk about some other topics because you're a wealth of information. Uh, so I want to let everybody know if you uh, first off, if you're looking for Pharma Vision, you can find that at PharmaVisionTV.com. Mm -hmm. You can find Justin and I at CPGInsiders.com or JekyllHydeLabs.com. Yep. You can always reach out to us and you go to the show notes and you'll find the links for David Birnbaum and Associates. We'll have links to his website and David's really active on Facebook and active in uh, a couple LinkedIn. of the yeah, LinkedIn yeah. groups. Yeah. yeah, we have a LinkedIn group, um, Consumer Goods and Retail Professionals. We've got 103,000 global members, and the conversations and the news that are posted there are really, really good. Uh, the other recommendation I have is RetailWire.com. It's a blog that I participate on along with about 50 other uh, experts in the industry and even though I'm a what they call one of the brain trust members, every time I'm on it, I learn something that I didn't know from the other people. So it's a great uh, it's a great blog as well, retailwire.com, and on LinkedIn, consumer goods and retail professionals. 
So, folks, if you enjoyed today's episode, leave us a five star review wherever you get your podcast, or feel and subscribe, subscribe to the show, and then every time we put a new show out, you'll know it's coming out. And uh, just so you know, because we only do shows, we've been doing shows every three to four weeks. Yep, we're gonna we're starting to try to get on a cadence of doing a new show every two weeks. Every two weeks. So we're trying to get a a little little more action going because yep. People are giving us a great response to yeah. the program. We're getting a lot of listenership. We're getting yeah. great response. And again, don't feel uh, don't feel bashful of reaching out and asking questions. And we're happy to try to answer them. Thanks, David, for being here. That's it for uh, Justin and I. We'll I see look you forward to the next time. We will see you on the next episode of CPG Insiders. If you're looking to greatly increase sales on your CPG product, don't hesitate to contact us at Jekyll and Hyde Advertising and Marketing. By the way, the only advertising agency with a guaranteed result. Just go to JekyllHydeAgency.com or feel free to give us a call at 800-500-4210.